the newest KW agent in the room, I would think. So I'm thrilled to be here. Interesting team dynamic this morning. This is pretty, uh, this is pretty cool. Out, okay? <laughs> anyway, so, so David and I uh, met uh, three months ago. Yep. Three months ago, is that can watch you up? And we, we, we realized as very, very little known fact is that we probably are Probably related in some way because we're from the same small town in Western North Carolina. So what are the odds with the same last name? It's in Alexander County, North Carolina. So, which is just interesting. Anyway, guys, anyway, David, well, is anybody else here for the very first time? I've done anything. Please introduce yourself. My name is Salma. This is my first day here, and I'm so excited to see where things take me. Cool. Let's give her a hand, guys. Not an agent yet. Huh? Not an agent yet. Exactly right. We like it. Okay, cool. All right, let us move on. You walk. We have we have a a packed meeting. But all right, some all right. Anybody here want to share good? Tell me something good. Anybody at all? Anybody? Tell me something. Come on, guys. Y'all have to have something good out there. Who likes this getting cooler? Yeah. Who likes it in a week from now, the election will be over with? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm tired of the answer on both sides. It's like I'm tired of it. Exactly. Okay, guys. Yeah, I have something good. It'll be over the next week. I have something good. Oh, please show me. Yes. Um, I have clients this morning um, who have a medical situation and they need to find a place. We're looking out of state, have been for many months, and then all of a sudden discovered in the neighborhood next to them the town home with an elevator and I wasn't looking at all I had seen that and I was like this is a great spot who do I know for this but they weren't looking in Atlanta mm -hmm. and um, anyway they he told me it had come into his mind and I was like yes yes this is the solution and we went over there and looked at it and got it under contract on the same day and it just feels like one of those ones that you sell that you're like it's a miracle that <laughs> we found something that works for them and if they really need it. So that's one of those ones that I feel like, oh, I did something really good today. <laughs> right, let's give her a hand, you all. That is great. Let us move on. All right, we have one of our favorite parties this morning. Yeah. 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 Word says when two or more attorneys are gathered, they may not agree. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to whatever she says. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have three attorneys here. Is that mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so Sherry and I were talking. She asked me to come in and talk about the lead-based paint. And if you, I do have um, a blog article about it. So it's on the smartsteps.com website uh, that's got some examples of some of the things. Um, but the, one of the changes, if you missed the, one of the mid-year classes, uh, a lot of them that were taught didn't go through the lead-based paint because we didn't know about it when the forms came out. Um, so some of us, I know when I taught here, I had already updated the class by that point. 
Um, but if you've noticed the July version of it, there are two agent initial lines on the form now. There's the seller's agent telling the seller about their obligations and giving them the document. And then there's the second initial line for the buyer's agent to tell the seller, who they've never met and don't have any contact info for, uh, about their obligations uh, with regard to lead-based paint. And then there's a note that says if the seller is paying compensation. Uh, so a couple of things about that. Uh, it came from the EPA. This was not a forms committee change. We don't like it. Um, I think it's BS, quite frankly. Uh, because you've tied it to compensation and how is that relevant to the health and safety of Americans. I don't really think that it is. Uh, so I think it's a political point and I think it's the EPA carrying the DOJ's water on this thing. Uh, so, but in terms of, if you look at the actual EPA forms, it doesn't say anything about uh, compensation on that actual initial line on the EPA side, but it has a footnote. And then you go to the footnote and it says if the seller is paying compensation, and so the question came up of, is that only if the seller is paying me directly? What happens if the seller is paying the seller's broker and the seller's broker is paying me? So then you go to the 34 pages of regulations and start reading. And in there, it says that the agent is anyone who is paid by the seller or paid by a representative of the seller. So unless your buyer is paying 100% of your compensation, you are now obligated to notify the seller about their lead-based paint obligations. And the failure to do so can result in a fine of $21,699. It adjusts for inflation every year now. So uh, it also, in all seriousness, can result in, if 21,000 is serious enough, uh, but it also can result in your brokerage being open up to investigation by the EPA. And that investigation would be up to three years of every file that they dealt with, even possibly files that didn't close but had gone under contract. Um, and they would come in and do an audit to see what else they can find uh, by going through all of those. So obviously the, the biggest stress point is like, again, you know, it's a joke, but it's real. Like how does the buyer notify a seller they've never met? Right, that's and, that they don't, and that they don't have any contact information mm -hmm. for. And does GAR have a form for that? No, because we didn't see it coming. Um, we didn't know about it when we finished the mid-year forms because the EPA also didn't tell any of us that they did this. They just up changed the form on their site and didn't tell anybody. Uh, so I, I do believe that there will be a form on January 1 specific to this. Uh, for now, we do have a notification form in our system, but it's not agents notifying parties, right? Because right. it's usually parties to a contract. Mm -hmm. So it has the seller is saying or the buyer is saying on my Smart Tips website, and I can email a copy of it to Sherry if you want me to, is just basically a doctoring of that notification form. So you don't check seller or buyer. I added another sentence that has a checkbox that's checked that says the buyer's broker is providing blah, 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 the disclosures, the forms, and, uh, and is notifying the seller of their obligation under 42 USC, whatever. And then the signature line at the bottom of it, it says party giving notice. Well, you're not a party. Uh, so on the signature line, the word party is struck out and it says buyer broker giving notice and then you would sign that right there. Um, but, you know, you have to do it. Uh, the other question has come up because the brokerages go two different ways and it's mostly because not only do lawyers disagree with each other, we also sometimes disagree with ourselves and change our mind about things. And there has been the question of, do you just do lead-based paint on everything so that you don't accidentally miss a property? Um, and, you know, because it's properties that were built after 1978, but you could have a property that's built in 2024 and requires a lead-based paint disclosure because you brought an old mantle into the house, like something that's reclaimed and you've introduced wood into current construction. Uh, so some agents will do it on everything. I don't know that that's a good plan considering like all the craziness that we have now with the buyer broker also having to get involved. And uh, so I would say do it 
every time you think that there is even the slightest possibility that you need to, but don't do it on the other ones because it's just, it's convoluted and stupid enough to begin with. Uh, so don't worry about it. And then I got a question from an agent because obviously when do the sellers, like if the listing agent's doing their job, when does the seller usually fill out the lead based paint disclosure? At the listing. So we had one in the last week where the property had been on the market since before July 1. So nobody did anything wrong. The listing agent used the form that was that was in existence. And typically we tell people don't don't use, you know, you don't have to pull forms in. you don't have to redo a seller's property disclosure. You don't have to redo a CAD. You can go with the older version. I wouldn't do that for this, bless you. Thank you. Um, I, would, I wouldn't do that for this one just because these regulations have been in effect apparently since April. Um, so it's been around for a while. And uh, so what I told the agent is either ask the seller's broker to put it on the new form or just have the buyer broker use that page of the new form, do what she's supposed to do, and basically add it as an additional page. Um, and that may be the path of least resistance because then you're not asking the seller and the seller broker to work um, and, and do extra work for that. So that's where we are with it. Um, uh, again, the question came up of is this what the form's going to look like in January? Yeah, because it wasn't a GAR forms decision, it was an EPA decision on this thing. So, any questions? Yes. Yeah. So when we're submitted an offer yes. for a property built before 78, mm -hmm. we are acknowledging that, I'm, I'm, what are we sending to the listing agent slash seller acknowledging? Yeah, that because the other question is how do you even send this to the seller? Because again, you've mm -hmm. never met them. Mm -hmm. So is it enough to send it to their agent? Uh, the EPA explains things by enforcement which means when someone does something wrong, then we say, oh, we won't do that. Um, and we don't have one of those for this, but I think the only way for you to give notice to a seller is to give it through their agent. So I think that that's who you're going to send it to. Notice in our contracts and in our brokerage agreements, notice to the agent is notice to the client. So it is as much as you can do. Um, but you have to send like the information about lead. Like the sample that I have has the GAR form that you would just include as an attachment to that notice. And you would do all of it that way. And that becomes an exhibit to the contract? It doesn't have to because it's just a notification, mm -hmm. but it would probably be up. I mean, I mean, you tell me, CYA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a notice well, regardless of whether it's made as yeah. part of the contract. It, it exists. You would want to keep the paper trail just like you would for anything that you're sending. Like if you send a notice to terminate, if you send a copy of the denial letter, if you send anything along the way, you would obviously, uh, what I tend to do is blind copy myself because I find it easier and then I'll stash because then that puts the sent email back in my inbox. And then I'll put it where I want to put it so that I don't I don't lose track of it later on. Mm -hmm. um, but I would keep anything where your proof of delivery. So in that scenario that you mentioned, where the buyer's agent, had, the seller's agent had not used the new form, uh -huh. if you were the seller's agent, what? what would if you I do? were the seller's agent, I'd go ahead and fill out the new one, just uh -huh. because it's also October, almost November now, and those were the forms changed out July one. And I think you are, because the biggest issue we have with all of this stuff is that we're dealing with other agents who are less aware and less knowledgeable about what's going on than we are. And that's the struggle, right? Um, so I think you would want to use the newer form because you're the listing agent who actually understands. And now you've got to, you want to make sure the buyer's agent does their job. Okay. So yeah. anything that we have under contract right now, you should go back and add this. I mean, I would. I mean, it does it fix it? I don't know. It says all of this is supposed to happen before the buyer is obligated to buy the property. You can't unring the bell, though, right? So you are you already are where you are right now. Um, so I would take a look at the transactions that I have and at least Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, we, we were all dealing with this as we were getting the information. It says mm -hmm. agents acknowledgement, mm -hmm. and it's spelled A G E N T apostrophe S. And that, and, S and that is you're not the first person person who has pointed that out. 
Um, the problem is that the problem is that we've got to make it's sure that we don't put your birth courage and yourself in the crosshairs of the mm -hmm. EPA. And okay. you think that that was a, a mistake? I think that, yes, birth? it was either a mistake by the guard forms when we were putting this together, or it was a mistake made by the EPA when they did it. Yeah. So, because what she's saying is above the signature line, it's singular. Mm -hmm. um, but I can also tell you that in the regs, I'm sure there is the generic language that we put in any contract that plural means singular and singular yeah. means plural. Oh, okay. and, yeah, because okay. yeah, we always cover ourselves. So masculine meets feminine, feminine meets masculine, so that's going to be a standard that's out there somewhere. Mm -hmm. All right, you want anything else? Another question? Oh, one last. And with that notification, where did you say that is, the form? Oh, the copy of the notification form, and it's an image. If anyone wants, I mean, it, it'll give you a sample because what you would do is use like the notification in yours. So my sample just shows you how to talk through it up. Uh, so that's on the smartsips.com website. And I'll get that mailed out. Yeah. Email that. Yeah. Will you bring him? Let us move on. <clears throat> Upcoming events. Let's let's have a white office you can see it and I can see it. <laughs> Upcoming events on um, social hour coming up November the seventh. Please come to that. Um, it's going to be in Marlowe's Tavern. It is a it is a um, appetizers um, and. Um, appetizers and drinks so please come um, br bring somebody with you bring your favorite co-op agent with you get extra points with me um, and Jalen so please come to that in November the 7th coming which is next Thursday so please come to that um, the s'more you know code of ethics if you don't have it please come November 14th scan here to register spooky scenarios ignoring buyers needs the buyer is purchasing um, the property for a specific purpose, they need to. I cannot quite read that. Mm -hmm. I may be able to. I think it, it came from it came from my class. Oh, thank you. So, uh, yeah, it, this was the class that I taught last month. So it talks about making sure that you carve out a contingency, or they, if the buyer has a specific need for the property, something that they're buying it to do, mm -hmm. making sure during the due diligence period that they will be able to do that thing. Yeah. Um, and if you are getting to the end of due diligence or you didn't get enough due diligence time, the F-607 is a general contingency form. It also has a kick out in it. Mm -hmm. If I were the buyer's agent, I would just steal paragraph A of 607 and use it as a stiff on an amendment or in the contract. If I'm a seller, I want the kick. I like that. I like the kick out better, right? Um, but one of the things that we talked about in the class was some of the things that the buyers may need to do with the property um, and that they may need to verify. So, what are some examples of those sorts of things? Chicken farm. If they chicken farm. Yes. Swimming pool. Yeah. Swim, putting in a swimming pool. Renting it. Rental or short term rental because the the short term has its own. The ability to put an ADU on the property. Uh, the I had one where the woman uh, bought the property so she could have her horses on the property and found out after closing she wasn't allowed to put a barn on the property. Um, so any of the, and, or something small, a basketball goal, like whatever that thing is, something that they have to verify with the HOA or the city or the county. Like they have a dog limit. 25 pounds and you have a 75 pound dog or the number actually we had yeah. one somebody uh, responded on my facebook and it wasn't the size of the dog it was the number of dogs yeah. 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 it was the quantity that was so it's any of those sorts of things because the, the woman with the horses came in after closing to physically confront me about it and uh i told her i didn't even know she liked horses <laughs> which didn't go over well and uh, but but who, when she didn't get satisfaction from me who did she go after next because who did know she liked horses the agent, the agent did yeah so but yeah some options for that do your homework guys thank you thank you thank you all right partners who is up kyle is kyle, kyle. Woo, supreme lending good morning everybody we also do have Hunter, but he's virtual. He's not going to be in today, um, so he's just spying on us all. Um, we're, glad have, we're glad to have him. glad to have him, guys. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hunter Matt. Um, so I just wanted to touch on two things, kind of market related. The first one is the market is extremely volatile right now. 
we're getting ready for the election. It's everybody probably already voted or that all is just causing craziness. I'm telling all of my clients, if you like these numbers right now, block them right now. And so um, people obviously make their own decisions there, but that's a big, big factor to consider is that we don't know what's going to happen and how significant it's going to be in the coming days. Um, so that's part one. The other side of it is that, as we all know, this is a buyer's market strong right now. So leading people and allowing them to get and capitalize on seller credits is, is really a good opportunity, especially for buy downs. So everybody knows about buy downs, but just as a refresher, we can do four different types of buy downs. We can do one year, two year, three year, and then we can do kind of a variance on the two year where it's instead of dropping their interest rate by 2% for the first year and 1% for the second year. It's just two years of dropping it by 1% each year, so it keeps it a bit more consistent, but it's also a bit more affordable. Um, so that can be a super good tool to use to kind of bridge the gap between current volatility, current market, and where we're hoping and where the forecast is leading us. Um, so that's a big thing. Also, seller credits can be used in conjunction with down payment assistance programs. I sent out an email a couple, I think it was last week, about a 100% financing program that we have. That really cuts down costs, but we can use that in conjunction with uh, seller credits. So um, though I don't advertise it, there's been a couple loans that I've done in the past 12 months where the buyer paid for their inspection, but then got their earnest money reimbursed and every single thing paid for uh, by the seller. And so that was 100% financing and seller credits to do the rest. So when people have unique budgets and unique needs, just don't, I guess, shift the mindset from, ah, no, sorry, maybe save up more money or now's not the time, to at least sending them our way, getting it checked out, seeing if there is an opportunity for them. Um, so that's really it. Also, last night I sent out the Doug Duncan clips. Uh, so if anybody didn't receive those and wanted them, just let me know. And I don't know if my list is perfect, so just let me know if you wanted those and you didn't get it. And otherwise, great. Let's give them a hand, guys. Welcome, Southern Comfort Movers. Come on up, Southern Comfort. Thank you. Thank you. Get Thank comfortable you. today. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Always good to see everybody. I'm uh, not going to take up much of your time. We just want to put our face, a face to the name. We thank you for all of su the support that you guys have extended to us. Um, and uh, just want to introduce myself. I'm Evan. I'm one of the operations managers. A lot of you had the opportunity to either talk to me or uh, you sent clients our way. And uh, we just want to say we appreciate uh, you allowing us to be part of your success. You guys have done a phenomenal job out there, and we're just kind of uh, riding on the shoulders of your, your success, so thank you kindly. Um, what I'd like to do at this time, so you guys can get to your meeting, is to offer just a couple of uh, things to you. What we will be doing for the rest of the year, and we were remiss at uh, not doing this before, we've offered uh, discounts to your clients. But for anyone that sends uh, business to us, Move. We're going to be doing for the rest of the year a $200 uh, to you all as a referral fee. So anybody you send to us, just let them know. Because uh, we always ask, who referred you? And we keep that name at the end of the move. We'll make certain that you get your $200. Uh, so just kind of keep that in mind. I do have a couple small gifts now that I'd like to leave just to show you uh, our good faith. But uh, can I ask who is the newest agent in your organization? Newest. Uh, uh, probably. Wow. Yeah, lucky that. I do have a $20 uh, gas card for you, my friend. Nice. Thank you. I'm not the only person. Wait, there wasn't there wasn't one Personally, the oh, more time. Oh, man. <laughs> I had to give you a checkbook. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> hey man. Uh, then my last one uh, is. Um, <laughs> the oldest. <laughs> Longest in rules. Longest in, who, in the who, who comes the furthest uh, to uh, a meeting? Uh, anybody know what to drive? Who, who might travel the farthest? Laura. Or oh, help you out with the gas. Where do you come from? I'm like 
Canton almost like Waleska. Dallas. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Dallas. How many miles? Yeah. Well, y'all can split this thing. <laughs> 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 Thank you. So, Jim, I appreciate it. Thank y'all for your time. Y'all have a wonderful uh, rest of the week. Yes. Uh, this is just my thing. I want to say thank you to Dr. Kelly for being here. He tells you're going to do it. He's yeah. like your book's going to happen. Yeah. Guys, one day you can screw up your reputation and give them someone the wrong move. That'll screw it up, boys. Can we thank you for breakfast, guys? So I'm going to stop for a minute. I'll bring the list up here. Who knows about our breach of our profit share? And I want to let's come up and sort of say what happened. Um, and if, yeah, if you want to throw any darts, anybody throw it, Melissa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so some of you may know, you may not, um, but last week there was a breach in command, and 95% of our agents have had their profit share information put in incorrectly, and it all was sent to another person. Yeah. So. You're going to need to remember right now we need to update all of our command passwords. Yeah. So if you haven't done that, if you're having trouble with that, let me know. Come down. We can help you. Yesterday was a train wreck with it. Mm -hmm. Today it's much better and it's pretty much immediate. So you shouldn't have any trouble getting that updated. So we'll do that. And then while we're doing that, if you've got your banking information, I can show you where to go in to update your banking information for profit share. Please remember, if you don't have profit share right now, that's okay. But we still need to update it because it's still wrong. If you ever do have profit share, it's going to go to this relic Christian somebody. Mm -hmm. You don't want that. So we need to update it regardless. If for some reason you can't get in and do it, we'll be happy to help you do it on our end. Um, but we do need to get this done. And the ones that have not received profit share for last month, you will get made whole we're not sure exactly when, how long it will take, but it will happen. You will get your money, so don't worry about that. Um, and it's just it's been a process, so we're getting there. So does anybody have questions on it right now? And then I'm happy I can come, come down afterwards. We can talk about it. Yes. Was banking information exposed during not. the break? Okay. No, the one good thing is with the system, it does give, like we even, we can look at your bank, the name of the bank, and the rounding number, we do not have any information on the account number. So that's why I can't even tell you for sure. I just am assuming if the bank name is wrong, because the person put it in, then your information is wrong. So, but no, banking information was not touched. You should not have any problems on that. But that's a good question. So even though it says on command on the front page that you've got X number of profit share, it probably is not in your account. There are some, some I, was, I was going to say, there's some get, bins, there doesn't seem to be a lot of rhyme or reason for it, and so it's going to take KWRI doing some research to figure out which ones weren't. A lot was already returned, so even if, if it was, say, $10,000 that was supposed to go out to all of the agents, over half of it was automatically returned, KWRI has that money right now. So once we get most of our agents have updated their profit share banking information, they'll be able to re import that. So the ones that don't, they're the ones that we're going to have to figure out um, how to get you guys paid. So it's a process. In the password, there's a special way to do it now, and it's pretty long. So even if you have your normal passwords that you always use that they tell you not to do, yeah. but yeah. It's yes, it's weird, 12 characters yeah, now, yeah. uppercase, lowercase, mm -hmm. symbols, and numbers. So yeah. it's going to have to be a little bit more detailed, and uh, that will hopefully keep us from happening again. Yeah. Anybody else have a question, Joel? Well, yeah. Just come down. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It was very easy to change. Yes. Yeah. So it's oh, interesting. If you do it early enough, it was fine. Well, I, did. I did it the minute we got no. you this. Okay. okay. I was going to say, by the time people started to know about it, it was a train wreck, and yesterday was terrible. But it's fixed now, and it's immediate. The um, All of the problems all of the problems have been fixed on that end, so you should be able to get in and get it updated without any trouble. But totally come see us. Much easier now. We're happy to help. Yes? We do not have any banking Stored. You, still have you will have banking information stored. When you join KW, that's one of the things that was automatically put into 
the system so you do have things so because that's part of Kimberly's whole onboarding thing. So, like, I have people that were like, I joined 10 years ago, I don't have banking. I'm like, yeah, you do. It was just so long ago, and it, if you haven't had profit share, it never came up, but it is saved. So, we need to get it there. And you all, when this happened last week, they were on quickly. Scott was here quickly because yeah. he is taking my class in cybersecurity. Yeah. He knew what to do. So, guys, we're doing everything on we can. Exactly and, right. you know, KWRI has definitely try to help out and make sure that we're keeping things as safe as possible and they're helping us get everybody kind of back whole again. Cool. Yeah. Can we thank her for a great guy? Guys? Stuff like we have right here on this because big guys they were on it quick. Yes, we're definitely working. And out. they left me out of the whole process. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> How widespread was it? Uh, it's Quan. Uh, it's Kwan. Uh, so we're the reason why the whole exactly. KWRI system is yes. All 180,000 employees or agents can think of. But we're helping make it more safe. Um, now it's just a little bit of pain trying to get things. And it was Billy's fault? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always stop the bus there. The good news is, the funny good news is that last month was one of our least profitable yeah. months of the whole year. Yeah, I got 24. Right. Exactly. So guys, just realize right. the good news one. was last month was was there was a bad profit month. Bad news was that they didn't get much money because of whatever profit month. Now we're still profitable, right. but but just lots of money. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, we're, yeah. we're, 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 anything else? Yeah, yeah, just let me know if you have questions. But we should be kind of kind of kind of routine now to get it fixed and updated. So you should be good to go. So. Let's give it a hand, guys. Mike, come on up here. Introduce yourself. I want to get our speaker on, guys, because uh, he's been waiting long enough. And um, Michael, um, I'm sure that uh, Michael is an attorney, um, and he specializes, I hope I'm saying the right thing, Michael, in foreclosure, not foreclosure, in, in, in people that are in houses and should not be there. Michael, I'll pass those out for you. I can do it for you. Uh, keep going. Anyway, so, guys, so I'll, I'll ask him to come around. in today and talk to you about questions like, well, if I have a squatter in my house, what can I do? If, if, if the seller stays in there after closing, what can I do? If I have a renter in there and they're not paying rent for so many months, what can I do? So I've asked him to sort of come because he does this regularly. So let's welcome Mike. Come on, Michael. I'll be glad to have you here. Everybody agree with that? No. <laughs> um, thank you, Jim, for the we're opportunity to speak. Um, I'm going to kick this out of the way. Okay, we'll go right now. A little bit. Um, What's going around right now, I've, so I have an attorney, I've been practicing for 22 years, my office is here in East Cobb, uh, but I go all over the metro Atlanta area. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of things here, we're balancing a couple of things, right, need for speed, but we also want to protect the tenants, uh, somebody's got to stick up for the tenants. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about me for, for just another second, so you know who I am. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about when you have to evict. Um, what's going around right now is a ch one page checklist that describes the entire dispossessory process. Um, some of you, uh, hand, quick show of hands, who's done this before? Done what? A, a dispo, an eviction. Okay, a handful. How many of you um, represent uh, investors, people who are looking for rental properties? Okay. How many of you work with property management or manage your own properties? How many of you have rental properties? Okay, so most everybody in the room hopefully will touch on something uh, that actually matters to you. Um, if you didn't raise your hand at all right now, I'm very sorry that I'm here. Um, <laughs> hopefully you'll learn something anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about a new law that went into effect in July, the uh, Georgia Squatter Reform Act. We're going to spend a little bit of time on that. We're going to talk about a couple of things you can't do, um, which is what most of the time lawyers are telling you what you can't do. Um, and then leave it up to you to figure out whether you can do something else. We're also going to talk a little bit, I'm going to probably go through that fairly quickly, about a couple of changes to the DISPO process that are a little bit related to this um, from another new law that came up, the Safer Home Act. And then I can hang around for a little bit to do Q&A if you guys have them. Okay, so that's what we're going to talk about. So I've been doing landlord-tenant law. Take a picture of that. That's my office number and my email address. Feel free to call or email with questions anytime you want. Um, especially email, you'll get a faster response. Uh, but I've been doing landlord tenant law for my entire career. I started out as a mediator um, in uh, the um, 
Fulton County Landlord Tenant Project back when I was still in law school. So I've been doing this for a long time and I've seen a lot of different changes. I've done landlords, I've done tenants, I've done presented resident, uh, residential situations, commercial situations, I've kind of done it all there. Um, and I do some other real estate and small business stuff as well. Um, I also wrote this book, uh, Brief Guide to Georgia Evictions. It is available on Amazon if you want it. And if you pay attention and answer our trivia question at the end correctly, um, you'll get that copy walking out of here. So um, it walks you through in a little more detail how to handle a dispossessed reaction here in Georgia. All right, and I do this a lot. So if you have another group, a RIA group, or an investor group, or something like that, you want me to come do this presentation again, I'm happy to do that or present on something else. I can do that as well, so we can talk about that. Okay, the key to remember is balancing the landlord's right to receive rent against the tenant's right to have a safe place to live. Those are both important to whatever judge you're in front of, okay? Do they favor landlords? Very often, yes. Because, let's be honest, the landlords are the taxpayers. Do they protect the tenants? Sometimes they do, and it can feel unfair. Both sides, I promise you, landlords and tenants will bitch at you equally about how unfairly they're treated by the process, okay? Which means it's probably a decent process. We have seen a few changes. The legislature doesn't want to protect deadbeat tenants, but the le legislature also doesn't want to protect slumlords either, okay? So keep that in mind as you're kind of feeling your way through some of these laws. The first sort of threshold question is when do you have to evict? In other words, you, you, we've all, maybe not all, but probably all either dealt with or heard of a situation where somebody has just taken up residence in a place and now you gotta kick them out and you find out to your dismay that you have to file a dispo against them. Until July, that was almost always the case, okay? So <clears throat> the code says, that the relationship of landlord and tenant is created when the owner of real estate grants to another person the right to be there, okay? And that's kind of the key language because we've heard, um, you know, you have to, why would you have to file a dispo against a squatter where the landlord or the owner of the property has never met this person, they just show up and they find out that this person has taken up residence in their house, somehow had the power turned on and then used the power bill to have all the other utilities turned on. As a side note, how often can that happen? If you're visiting your properties regularly enough, that should never happen. Um, but that lack of any connection between the two kind of makes that person a squatter. But we were still, until we had the Squatter Reform Act, had to use the dispossessory process, okay? Owner of real estate can't act through an agent. A writing is not required. So somebody who has you know, that college roommate that has couch surfed with you and that then you move that couch into the bonus room in the basement and then you let them stay there for six weeks and then it's like hey ricky when are you gonna you know get your own place when are you gonna get out and he says well i live here now you have to dispo ricky okay you don't have a written lease but you do not have to have a written lease in georgia at least can arise by implication at least can arise uh, by oral contract okay payment of rent is not required so the fact that Ricky was a complete uh, deadbeat for you and never even so much as bought a box of cereal to put in your kitchen doesn't matter, okay? So all these things can make that person a tenant. They may be a tenant at sufferance um, who you can get rid of a little bit more easily, but they're still a tenant, you still got a dispo. And we talked about that, can arise by implication, okay? Now, if you have a squatter, there is finally relief. So let's talk about that. The Georgia Squatter Reform Act did two things, okay, they're related. The first one is it created a new crime. This one is not directly relevant to you, but I wanna take you through it anyway, because I want you to see where the legislature's head was at. There is now a crime, unlawful squatting. Um, this is the whole text of the statute. The part I wanna focus on is that acting without the knowledge or consent of the owner. Remember before we looked at the code section on landlord and tenant, and we were talking about a grant of permission, right? You're allowing them to do that. This solves that problem, acting without the knowledge or consent of the owner, okay? Now that can be dangerous, so there are some protections built in. You have a four-year tenant, and you decide they're a squatter. I've never heard of that guy. No, you can't do that, okay? Um, but unlawful squatting is a misdemeanor. Uh, normally a misdemeanor would be a smaller fine, a relatively short jail sentence. Those are your possible punishments, but there is a little bit more to it with respect to this particular law because of the special situation you're in. 
So there's a citation issued, and the accused has three business days, so include you know, exclude holidays, exclude weekends, um, to come up with, quote, properly executed documentation, end quote, authorizing them to be there. What does that mean? The statute says it may include a properly executed lease or rental agreement. The statute also says it may include proof of rental payments, because remember, a lease does not have to be in writing to be valid and enforceable, okay? I don't know what else that could be, um, but the statute gives these two as examples of what it, quote, may include, okay? Um, so, properly executed documentation authorizing them to be there will be a good defense to the crime of unlawful squatting. They don't have that documentation, they're subject to immediate arrest. That's even better than an eviction, mm -hmm. right? Because an eviction has to be scheduled after you get rid of possession, and it takes a while. But being subject to immediate arrest means they're out. You can change the locks, you can shut the power off, and so on. If documentation is provided, then the court has to set a hearing, quote, within seven days of submission. That's pretty fast. It's not going to feel that way to the landlord or your client who wants the, pro the these people out of your property yesterday, but a week is really, really friggin' fast in our world. Okay? If the court finds documentation insufficient, then they're subject to a demand for possession or removal and arrest. DFP stands for demand for possession. Okay? Okay. The other change was to overhaul the ejectment section of the Georgia Code. Now, this is really nerdy for just a second, okay? There used to be such a thing as ejectment. The rightful owner or possessor, so the tenant with a subtenant, for example, could issue an affidavit claiming the right of possession and claiming that someone else was in possession. That sounds like a squatter. That's basically what it is. If that happened, the sheriff would turn them out on the spot unless that person tendered a counter affidavit claiming the right of possession. And the sheriff was authorized by statute to administer the oath so they could make that counter affidavit. Okay? And then what happened? The sheriff would file both affidavits and there would be a jury trial. Not only that, the statute said that jury trial would take place within seven days. Now in 1870, that might have been possible. Okay? But that has become impractical to say the least. So um, ejectment is basically gone from the code, and the Georgia Squatter Reform Act is what we have now. So the new law preserves that. It really is kind of intended to do the same thing, but to take into account the fact that it's 2024, not 1873, um, or whenever the ejectment statute was actually in. So the owner can use an off-duty officer. This is a big change, and we'll revisit this again in the dispo process, okay? That's my term. Not as, I put it in quotes there. Um, but that's my term of art. This is what the code actually says. So the sheriff for Cobb County, for example, has to maintain a list of, quote, authorized off-duty sheriffs, sheriff's deputies, constables, marshals, and other individuals certified by the Georgia uh, Peace Officer Standards Training, I forgot what it stands for, but the Post Council, that's what all the cops have to take to be qualified to be cops, okay? And make it available to a landlord who asks for it. So they don't even have to be currently employed as sheriffs or cops. They could have that in their background, but maintain their certification. I see a private industry growing here um, because there is and will be a demand for that, uh, not only with regard to squatters, but also with regard to actually evicting people. We'll talk about that again in a minute. Okay, squatter gets three days before being turned out, even if they're guilty. They, they get the three days, okay? That's the window to provide that counter affidavit. And then if there is an affidavit and a counter affidavit, the officer returns both to magistrate court. That's important for a couple reasons. One, state and superior court are the courts of record in your county. Those are going to be bigger deal courts. That's where felonies happen. That's where divorce cases happen. That's where condemnation cases happen. Um, you know, malpractice cases, personal injury cases, all of those things happen in the big boy courts uh, of state and superior court. Magistrate usually handles dispos, usually handles small claims, usually handles things like garnishments um, and some low-level crimes, okay? But they're also much faster in most cases. Um, the judges handle a lot of cases a lot of cases per calendar. The judges tend to be, um, the full-time judges are judges that work for the county, but there are usually a lot of part-time magistrate judges who are practicing attorneys. That's helpful. Judges who are elected judges, judges who work full-time for the government, 
They are government employees. And I do not denigrate any government employee. I am married to a government employee. But they're government employees, nine to five, Monday through Friday. Otherwise, they're, other, they're regular people. Judges that have a private practice background, I have found, tend to be a little bit more realistic and reasonable in terms of appreciating the practical realities that we face in the real world. Okay. The other thing that being in magistrate court gets you is, quite frankly, the rules of evidence are relaxed. It's not um, the, the judges will just kind of get down to brass tacks with, um, you know, okay, what do you want to tell me? What do you want to tell me? And they will make a decision. And they won't get hung up on some technical things too often. Sometimes that's bad. If it is bad, you can appeal. Normally, you would appeal a magistrate court decision to the state or superior court, not all the way to the state level court of appeals or the Supreme Court. But not so. Here, you'll have your non-jury trial. There is actually no right to a jury trial. And your appeal skips state or superior courts and goes to the Georgia appellate courts. That's important. If you've ever handled a dispo in magistrate court, you probably run into a tenant who had the street smarts enough to file an appeal and tie the case up for another three or four or six or eight months. Okay? That's not going to happen here. It can. You still have that appellate right to go to the court of appeals, and that takes a long time, but it's a lot harder to do. And most squatters, I would submit to you, are not, excuse me, going to figure out how to do this. Okay? So, all in all, I think a pretty well thought out process. I do want to talk about a couple of things you can't do. Um, you, as the landlord or the owner of the property, still have to keep the property in good repair. If there is a, uh, if you do have a tenant situation, they're supposed to be paying you rent and they're not paying you rent, you can't stop taking care of the property. You can't, my favorite case was one, a decision I read from the early 80s where the landlord um, wasn't getting his rent, so he took the front door. <laughs> took, like, off the hinges, walked away with the front door. Arguably the most important part of the house. <clears throat> and he just took it. And, he said, and the court said, no, you can't do that. Um, landlord can't cut off utilities. Um, they actually added explicitly cooling. So if it's July and it's 98 degrees outside, mm. that's a public health issue. You can't cut off Granny's he heating and air just because she's not paying your rent. Okay? Um, there is a criminal liability if you do that, up to $500 per violation. Landlord can't change the locks, can't deprive the tenant of quiet enjoyment. So if you have a tenant, we've moved away from squatters now, we're talking about tenants. Um, you have to follow the dispossessory process to get possession back. The tenant is obligated to pay you rent. The landlord is obligated to provide all these things. And those two obligations are independent of each other. So I talk with tenants all the time about, no, you cannot withhold your rent because your landlord is not fixing that broken window. You can't do that. Okay? That happens a lot, but it's not legal and it's going to subject the tenant to being dispossessed. Landlord can't remove the tenant's stuff. Abandoned property is a little bit of a different issue, but you have a proof issue there. We'll come back to that. If the property is abandoned, make sure you, apparently I put it right here, sorry. Um, it's always fact specific. You walk into a property and there's trash everywhere, and it looks like trash, but one man's trash is another man's treasure. And if you throw it away, you will eventually be accused of having stolen the duplicate copy of the Declaration of Independence and the six million dollars in South American Krugerrands or whatever it is. Um, that gold bullion that people keep with them. Anyway, keep pictures, keep video. It's following the dispo process and having the writ properly executed. It takes time, but it's always the safer course of action. It is the only legal way to get somebody out of a piece of property when they're uh, when they're a tenant and they have the right to be there. If you have the ability, I do uh, uh, advise my clients, if you have the ability to store the property somewhere for some period of time and attempt to reach the tenant, that's a good thing. That's probably insurance against a later claim. Um, this is, is going to be a judgment call. What is the property in question? Can you keep it in an outbuilding on the property as opposed to having to rent storage space or something? I mean, it's always going to be a judgment call, but if you can do that. Okay, the Safe at Home Act. These are... Um, there are a few changes here. Some of them are to the dispo statute itself, um, and these were probably the biggest ones. There are still the three grounds for dispo. Um, failure to pay rent is the biggest one always. Holding the property over beyond the term they were rented, and then um, being a tenant at sufferance, which is basically what squatters were before we gave them a different legal status, as we just discussed. Okay. 
Um, so those are still there. Holdover and tenant sufferance still treated the same as always. You need a demand for possession. Talk about that in just a second. Um, and then that is a condition precedent to file a dispo, but you don't need to do anything else. Failure to pay rent is different. Okay. Now it includes rent, late fees, utilities, and other charges owed to the landlord. That's what the statute now defines um, as recoverable for a rent failure. The inclusion, this is me being a legal nerd here, of late fees here is to me kind of a big deal. You've probably seen the GAR forms have and other homegrown leases have some pretty convoluted looking language that we use uh -huh. to try and make sure that everything that could be due under a lease is characterized as rent even if it's obviously not rent, something like a late fee. That's because there was a decision um, from one of the Georgia appellate courts called Southeastern Lands Fund versus somebody that said that um, use of terms like fees, penalty, forfeit, these are not favored under Georgia law, and so you can't have those. So if you charge a late fee, you run the risk of um, having that be deemed an unenforceable provision of the, of the lease. So. Instead, we have this language that says any rent payment that if, if any rent payment remains unpaid for more than five pay, days past its due date, an additional rent amount of 5% of the uh, rental amount would then be due as additional rent. It's additional rent. The form all that says, guys, make sure we're not calling this a fee, right? Um, now it includes the rent, the late fees, the utilities. You don't have to separately define the utilities as rent. If the utilities are due under the lease, that, the failure to pay, if they pay the rent but not the utilities, you can still dispo them for a rent failure. You just have to follow the statute, okay? All right. Landlord now sends a, quote, notice to pay, vacate or pay. So the other thing that has now been formalized into the law is the pay or quit notice. There, that, the pay or quit notices were commonly used for good reason. They make sense. You pay to stay. If you don't pay, you don't stay. Um, but what was needed was a demand for possession. So there was some confusion. Well, do you want me to pay or do you want possession back? If you want possession back, why are you charging me? Why should I have to pay if you're trying to get possession back? I, I only possess because I've paid. If you want me to pay, you must not want me to leave. And there was this confusion in the law. So now we have pay or quit notices authorized under the law, which is good. Um, tenant must be given three business days. So I used to, uh, I did this. I was I used to send demands for possession that said you have until five o'clock p.m. the day you receive this notice, mm -hmm. and then I could file the dispo the next day. Perfectly legit. Not anymore. I got to give them three business Why? days. Okay. Tenants have rights too. I get it. anyway. All right. Um, and then this is new. Uh, the the notice itself is now legally required to be in writing. That was never actually required. Mm -hmm. You could drive up, park in the driveway, roll down the window, say, hey, get out! That's your demand for possession. Good luck proving you did that. If they said you never did that. And I used to tell uh, my landlord clients, my investor clients, that your uh, oral demand for possession is worth the paper it's printed on. Now it's not even worth that uh, because it has to be in writing. Okay, So I'm glad for that change, actually. Um, and this, this is idiotic to me. I understand what they were trying to do. Um, demand for possession notice, three-day notice to vacate or pay, shall be posted in a sealed envelope conspicuously on the door of the property. And you can deliver it any other way you want to, but you have to do that. So, you email it, fax it, carrier pigeon, FedEx it, and certified mail return receipt requested. But don't do that and your demand is no good. Wow. So you have to do it that way. You only have to do it that way. I now use a process server to handle the demands out there for two reasons. One, he's a guy I have a relationship with and I tell him to send me a picture of the envelope sealed and put stuck to the door just like the statute requires. And two, um, he knows how to handle himself. I think this is a safety issue. Yes. yes. FedEx UPS certified mail is not sufficient by itself. Hand deliver and take a picture, but be careful. Yeah. Okay. If you think if your property is not in the best neighborhood, or if your tenant is nuts, okay, make sure you are using somebody. Back to those off-duty officers. 
find one of those, have a relationship with them if you can have one. Um, and I think it's a good idea to have somebody who is trained to do this sort of thing, trained to serve warrants, quite frankly, yeah. um, handle this. Okay. Is there a question? Can was. we can we get a copy of this presentation? Because I don't. Sure. Know. Email okay. it to me. Thank you. Email, email me and um, yes. I'll get that. Any retainer? Huh? Any retainer <laughs> attached to that? No, no retainer. Because <laughs> otherwise I could go slower. You could take pictures of all these, right? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, just be careful. I, I hope there is a later tweak to the law that allows for something like, uh, you know, overnight delivery via a nationally recognized courier service should be fine. You know, FedEx, UPS, you know, because I can prove that delivery by typing it up on a computer anyway. You get it. Um, that's all I had sort of as a presentation. I'm happy wow. to take questions for a little bit. <laughs> Back here. In our lease, there's a length for how much uh, dispensary runs. How much is it running financially? Would you quote somebody when they ask you that question? I usually quote, I need to answer that with a bit of a caveat, okay? Most of my clients, um, I have a couple of investors, God bless them, they go, they buy a house or two at foreclosure, and then they have me clear them if necessary. Um, and they just kind of, we have that relationship, and I keep doing it. Um, when I get one-offs, there's usually something crazy has happened. Um, look up Sovereign Citizen Movement, if oh, you yeah. don't know what that is. Yeah. Um, I've, I, I deal with one or two sovereign citizens at any given point in time and have for my entire career. Um, something like that requires a little more special handling and a little more diligence, a little more perseverance. There's a lot of traps for the unwary. Those people will just wear you out. Um, another example, I will have a fair number of clients for whom English is not their first language. Um, and they just don't present well when they're on their own in court. Um, never mind that their English is way better than my Vietnamese or Korean or Spanish, but, um, they just, they need me to help that. So. Mine tend to be a little bit on the higher side. I usually am charging $1,500, $2,000 for a retainer for those to handle them front to back. Um, and then, you know, can get, I, I bill by the hour. So this guy can be the limit to so get a tenant who so figures out how to get As a landlord, if I want to cover myself, put what, a grand in there, $1,500? Like, I think that's reasonable. Like, okay. $1,500, $1, something like that. Um, it also gives you something to negotiate away if, yeah. if you can get your tenant to leave voluntarily. Here's the other thing. My number one piece of advice in any dispo situation, I, I know the number is going to get higher than you want it. Walk away from the rent if the tenant will walk away from the property. Right. Getting that property back so that you can put somebody in there and making an in, income generating asset for you again is of paramount importance. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I've seen uh, landlords, I've had landlords walk away from rent in the $70,000 range just to get the house back so that they could rent somebody who would pay. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, situation where <clears throat> higher rent, 3500 mm -hmm. she decided because of the leak that she is leaking one of the bathrooms, that she's not paying rent. End of the lease, and now she wants her earnest money back. Didn't pay last month's rent. Earnest money, you mean security, security deposit? I a security deposit, sorry. Mm -hmm. Earnest money. So, mm -hmm. obviously, you didn't pay last month rent, right? So the question becomes is, how do you handle these? Uh, so my question becomes, what does the lease say? Mm -hmm. It's almost always what my question is. Yes. The GAR form and most other leases that have any level of sophistication to them usually say that the, form, yeah. that the security deposit, I know the GAR form says this, that the security deposit can be retained to cover past due rent. You have to first apply it to repairs, things that you normally apply the security deposit to, and you have to account for it, and you have to make sure the notice goes out on time, and so on and so forth. Um, but if there's any leftover security deposit after addressing repairs and you're owed rent, you're allowed to apply it to the rent, but again, you have to account for it properly and let the, let the tenant know that. We have one back here? Nope. I have one online. So what about if you rent the property to one tenant and then discover that the tenant doesn't live on the property and subleases every single bedroom? 
Okay. Um, they should call me. So the question was, what happens if you rent to a tenant and then tenant does not actually occupy the property and the tenant turns around and subleases every room? So you've got a four bedroom house who has four sub tenants. Um, you got you got a few problems. One, oh, the tenant's obviously in breach. Um, so you're going to dispo the tenant. You have four people who are not entitled to be there. They're all subject to dispossession as well. However, um, I would probably file one dispo uh, against your name tenant in your lease and all others. Uh, it's another thing. If you handle your own dispo, no matter who's on the lease, no matter who you name in the dispo and all others, add that at the end. Um, because anybody else in that property uh, who you haven't named, you arguably haven't the right to dispossess, mm. even if you get rid of possession because you haven't named them, but and all others covers everybody. So I would probably file a dispo against the tenant. Uh, well, again, what does the lease say? If the lease um, obligates you as a landlord to provide a notice to the tenant to say, hey, you got to kick all these people out and you've got to take possession. And if any of those are not done, then I'm coming after you, disposing you, I'm coming after you for um, damage to the property, et cetera, et cetera, and my legal fees, of course. Um, then that's what I would probably do, get them out. So, Mr. Balloon, over the back. back on what you just said. So, I notify my tenant that's on the paper that he's got to kick people out and he has to move in. When, what's the time frame that that has to happen? If the lease says, then you have to say that. So, if they have a 10 day um, cure provision or something okay. like that for any default, you have to follow that. Okay. If it doesn't, whatever you think is reasonable is probably fine, and it could probably be on the shorter side, especially for something like that. Okay. If you have seven days, something like that would probably be okay. I deal with a lot of dead people, and we are finding... It's usually easier to dispo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we're finding a, a lot um, where, and maybe this new squatter law will help us with it, where the owner dies, and we then can't get the other folks that were living there out. Usually, it's an adult child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow. I'm going to suggest to you they're generally not going to be squatters mm -hmm. if, it, if they were living there. They probably have the right to be there. I did have a situation, maybe this is what you're talking about, where um, mom died and the son took that opportunity to move in. That's a horse of a different color. Yeah. Having said that, who do you represent? Right? We're talking about the mom owning the property. Um, you have to probate first to have a personal representative that can represent the estate. And so she said, yeah. so they're seeing it there probate first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because up until then, it's no man's land. There's no one who can speak for it. Mm -hmm. She was the only person on title. She's yeah. it. And yeah. until there's a, per, a PR, you don't have anyone to file. That probate action. takes a lot. It can take a while. Having said that, um, there are county administrators. So if you have contested situations where nobody steps up to be the personal representative and nobody will actually do this, then um, the court will appoint a county administrator to handle that for you. I've been hired by county administrators to, to dispo people in that situation sometimes. But in that situation, the, there is no will. Or if there is a will, I'm asking. You can have an administration without a will. I, I actually have had it both ways. Yeah. Whether it was testate or intestate, but um, you can have an administration. You can have a limited administration without a, what, even if there is a will um, for for a single asset, for example, like that, to, to make sure you're preserving an asset for the estate mm -hmm. while they sort out, you know, which will is actually valid. And so, in in that situation, that let's say there is a will and the son is part of the will. It depends. You go back to, just like you said, you have to read the lease. You also have to read the will. Does he get the house? Is the house ordered to be sold? Is it proceeds? Is it shares? Is it... And how are you connected, right? If you, let's say that, I mean, you know, if you're an agent connected with this property, presumably it's through a management function of some kind on behalf of the owner. So, you know, if... We're trying to sell it. If, 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 if mom dies, but allowed son to live there... You know, that's your connection to mom, who is taking care of mom's estate. That's the person you're going to have to talk to. Mm -hmm. right. And that person can't get the person out of the house. That's the issue. Right. Is whomever is the executor. Yeah. Once someone is appointed, 
to act on behalf of the estate, they can then file a dispossessory on behalf of the estate. But it is a dispossessory, it's not squatter. That would be a dispossessory, not, okay. unless, right. unless it's a very specific fact pattern. Okay. No. Um, then it's almost certainly going to be a dispossessory of somebody who's Michael and, 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 and or whoever. We're getting more and more. We're we're found that we're, we list a piece of vacant property, and guess what? So they just ask to do it. They don't own the property. So how how do we protect mm -hmm. ourselves and the client? How, how, mm -hmm. Did you get a question? Same thing. How yeah. often should an owner or the representative actually physically check a property? Because you compete with quiet. So those are a couple different things. So to Jim's point, um, you know, if you get hired by somebody who doesn't actually own the property, I mean, I, you know, I'm not going to suggest that you do a full title search, but that might be the answer. Um, you they can. All have, they also have access to forewarn where they can look up names and telephone numbers to right. try and verify some things for identity purposes. That, and then you can also, um, Cobb County is great about this, but county by county, I would start with the tax assessor's office. Um, those are almost always online, and they're almost always freely and publicly available. You can put in the address, and it will tell you who it thinks the owner is. Now, if the county has it wrong, that's a different issue. But that's they're a usually pretending to be that person. Right. So the other thing they right. can do is reach out to the address where the tax bill is getting mailed, yeah. and then that it, that tends to be because the fraudster doesn't change right. the mailing address with the tax assessor or commissioner. Right. Yeah. Now the question back here was, how often should you check the property? That is up to the landlord, and I would put that in the lease. Yeah. Um, the better ones that I've seen are quarterly. And it doesn't have to be a big deal. We walk through on notice, um, you know, during regular business type hours instead of coming at Sunday at 11 o'clock in, in the evening. Uh, one more. Uh, what about tenant default other than failure to pay rent? Tenant default other than the pay rent, failure to pay rent. If the mm -hmm. lease says that it's a default, then it's a default. And they have breached the lease and they're subject to being... The lease probably then converts them to a tenant at sufferance, allows you to terminate the, the lease term right away, so there'll be a holdover or a tenant at sufferance, and you can just go that way. If other questions, I love doing it. I don't know how long, I can keep going. Any other questions? Let's see, one yes, more. Jill. Yeah. Suggestions for when we do a temporary occupancy mm -hmm. and the oh. seller doesn't get out when they say mm -hmm. they're going to get out? Those are disposed. Hopefully, your TOA is also in writing. Okay. So, this, that, so to, to tell me what you just now heard, Jim, Jim, what you just now hear, what can you do if someone's not good at? What, what you just now hear? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. My work here is done. Yeah. All right. Real quick, thank you. Squatter Reform Act overhauled and replaced what? Say that again. Squatter the Squatter Reform Act overhauled Act. Whole part of the Georgia Code and replaced Action what? 4. 1863. Yeah. That did what? Uh, what was it called? Tenant the the sufferance. The sufferance. Yeah. Possession. Changed from Possession. tenant of sufferance. Or sufferance. Looking for one word. Okay. Notification. Nope. <laughs> Starts with an E. Eviction. Eviction. No, no come on. It's not an eviction. Ejection. Ejection? Close enough. Ejection. <laughs> Michael, we love having you guys here. Again. Thank you so much for coming. Absolutely, you can stay for a minute. Okay. I got right. just a couple more things. We'll be finished. Uh, Sherry, if she did not left, <clears throat> telling you about our listing contest is going exceptionally well. We're we're, we're really um, leading listings again, right now, guys. So please continue to list because if you have to list to last, so that's still going on. Um, so to the end of the month, just a couple more days, okay? Um, remember, this is this is a payment coming up. The color trends is coming up. It's happening in October the thirtieth. At yeah. Home Depot down the road. Mastermind 2.0 with Mark King, CEO and founder of King Coaching. This is Wednesday, November the 6th, 11 to 2. If you'd like to, to um, go to this, I'm going to send you something out there where you can register or you register right there. Uh, Mark King was the president of our company for a few years. He is a very bright guy, um, lives in, in um, Austin, I think. Um, and he'll be coming um, there for luncheon, um, and so just need to RSV for let me want to come. And I'll send that to you there, okay. Business Planning Clinic. Thank you, R3, for getting this happen. This happen. Arthur, coming up. And this guy is, is fantastic. He did one um, a few uh, weeks ago, um, and one of our other and it was wonderful. But he's going to come, and it's going to be twin and stuff here. 
November, November 7th. November 7th. He's coming, guys. So please put that on your calendar. You must attend this because you need to know what you're going to do for next year for 2025. Yeah. And James Farron is a bold coach and also an agent in the Peachtree Road office. He and his wife, so they have a team. So, guys, this is coming up, guys. You ask for where it's here. So that's great. Okay? Okay, guys, we have a few of these people to give out. So, so I'm going to let me do this right here, you guys. Then we will um, put Jay on and we will be finished. All right. The many hats that Kimberly wears. Let's give Kimberly a hand. Yeah, Kimberly. All right. First, this thing Lisa Crosby. First, this thing. Annabelle Willoughby, yay, Annabelle! Way to go, Annabelle! Fabulous. And first closing, Cynthia Ridar. Come on, Cynthia! Way to go! Let's give her a hand. Fabulous. September campus, guys. This is one of my favorite things to do. What happens when you cap? You keep it all the money, guys. And I still need to tickle. Okay, the first one is who could this be? Amber! Is Amber here? Let's give Amber a hand. Way to go, Amber! Dan Fowler, our commercial buyer, one of the guys here again. Way to go, Dan. Proud of you, buddy. Angela Harris, way to go, Angela. <laughs> David House, way to go, David. Capping one more time on the Kelly Allen uh, group. This is great. And Fatima, come on up, Fatima. Yay! <laughs> Pauline Newman, Pauline here. I think she's not here, is she? Let's give her a hand, guys. Thank you, Pauline. Let it go. Marlene! Woo! <laughs> Joanna Smith, where's Joanna? Oh, Joanna! dressing up the next two days so if you want to join the party feel free to come on into the office dressed up we would love for you to have some fun with us uh the golden ticket is in the listing contest and so <laughs> participate in the listing contest you'll be closer to the golden ticket one thing that i do want to do we started this last week we want to honor those that give referrals within the month and so i wanted to call up shelly burner and marjorie caesar to come up and spin the wheel. You have the opportunity to win a prize. <laughs> come on up, come on up. Come on. Kelly and Marjorie are sharing referrals with us this month. You will have the opportunity to one, win one of Gary Keller's books. Uh, you may get $20 off of your office bill. You may have the opportunity of winning cash or a gift card or lunch. And so you will spin and after the meeting, come downstairs and we'll get you your prize. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. First girl. Spoons All right, and hard. Here we go. Ah. MREA, so you can get one of the books downstairs if there's one of the books that Thank you don't you. have. Right. Cash. All right, so you come down and we're going to get you some cash after the meeting. Awesome. Thank you for your referrals. Uh, this Saturday, if you know anyone that's in K-Score or if you're getting signed up today for K-Score, mm -hmm. uh, we are going to do a study session here at the office nice. from 930 to 1130 nice. for those that you know that are working towards getting their real estate license. So if there is anyone this Saturday, we are going to be doing a K-Score study session. And since the election is next Tuesday, we're going to have the next career night on November 12th. Uh, for lessons learned, going to um, definitely respect our time 
And with respect to three attorneys being in the building, I am not talking about contracts today. <laughs> what I want to go over, we all received an email last week from Gene about the Q3 statistics. Did anybody take a like, look at that? Raise your hand if you took a look at the statistics that were sent. Alrighty, so this is going to give you a lead in to the Q3 market matters that's on November 12th. I'm just going to go over the East Cobb statistics. So you do know what Q3 looked like in East Cobb. The total homes for sale for Q3 2024 was 282. The total homes sold, and this is detached homes under 750. The total homes sold is 437. The median list price was 535,000. The median sold price was 510,000. The median days on market was 20 days. The month supply was 1.9 days. Some things to take note of for the detached homes under 750 for Q3 of 2024 is that there were almost 100 more total homes for sale. In 2023, it was 192. Uh, when it comes down to total homes sold, it was down 9.5%, almost 10%. Something to highlight on the median list price and the median sold price for East Cobb is that it did reach above 500,000. So it did reach above half a million for both the median list and the median sold. For the median list to the median sold, median list was 535, median sold was 510. So that was a 25,000 decrease in where properties actually sold at. For median days on market in 2023, it was 11 days on market. In 2024, it was 20 days on market. So that's a nine day increase. And then who knows technically what it takes for it to be a seller's market, for it to be a balanced market, or for it to be a buyer's market. What does it take technically, Liz? It used to be six months worth of inventory for it to be a balanced market. I think we took it to like four. Mm -hmm. According to these stats, it's still six months. I think four is just trying to be, that's like soft parenting, you know? <laughs> uh, I think that's the soft parenting generation. Uh, but generationally, uh, traditionally, it's been six months. And so when it comes down to month supply, uh, it went from 1.2 in 2023, and then uh, it went to 1.9 for 2024. And so that's still reflecting the seller's market. There are statistics on attached below 750, but I'm just gonna read the luxury. And then you can, I would highly just suggest that you all take a moment to take a look at these stats in your inbox. It's very great information covering the entire metro area. But for luxury detached homes over 750,000, uh, the total homes for sale in East Cobb was 134. The total homes that sold was 171. The median list price is 975,000. The median sold price was 950,000. The median days on market was 17, and the month mm -hmm. supply was 2.4. So with that, just working it backwards, that 2.4, it is closer to a balanced market. But one thing I will say in 2023, it was actually exactly the same in the luxury market. So there wasn't any shift right there. When it comes down to median days on market in the luxury in East Cobb, for 2023, it was 15 days. For 2024, it was 17 days. That's just a two-day difference. So in the luxury market, it wasn't as much variance as in the below luxury. Uh, when it comes down to the medium list to medium sold, the medium sold was $25,000 less. It was $975 to $950. I think what's interesting about that is in 2023, the median list price was $950,000 and the median sold was $975. So it actually flip flopped from 2023 to 2024. And so these are great bits of information to know for yourself and for your clients. It is in your inbox, and I would definitely suggest for you to come to Market Matters on uh, November 12th. All right, thank you. And dress up this week, join us. <laughs> this Friday, um, Shelly Hogan downstairs, uh, the work of Thomas and Barbara. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so you want to tell us about when we get together, please? Yes. Thank you for reminding me. So 12 to 1 o'clock tomorrow, uh, Friday. Friday, the first one. I was hoping today was Thursday. 
Yeah. But, uh, you can so. pretend. <laughs> I asked yesterday, I asked Carrie yesterday if yesterday was Friday. She's like, no, Cheryl, that's not how the week works. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, 12 to 1 on, but it's on the 1st. On the 1st, right? On the 1st. Friday the 1st. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, and uh, so come say hello. You can go anytime you want for the rest of the week, too. But a little, little get together uh, to celebrate all of her years with Thomas and Brown. Friday. She's a Jew. We all know this one. Yes, we will. I, I heard that she was chanting German on the line. But that's what <laughs> I, I can neither confirm too. nor deny. But okay. if you heard that, I'm sure it was accurate. So you all use your best judgment. Ah, I like that. <laughs> yeah, the details that we talk about. She is retiring. She's not going anywhere. Yeah, like, she's she not is, going it is anywhere. A she is like going to have fun and fun. retire. And she's, she's so excited. Ten years <laughs> away. She was here she's when not, I got here. She was here when I got here, and I've been here for 10 years. So, yeah. I think she's here 10 years. Yeah. She, she applied for a job at this office and I was around. Oh, yeah. Both oh, were sent to this. Um, which one she applied for first? I'll give that one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> she's fabulous. Guys, stop by see if you have time. Anything else, guys? Thank you so much. And let's give Michael a hand one more time. That's why I get that a lot. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. And you, you have some extras, Michael. Yeah. So, yeah. Take them for the